Praise and glory be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon his noble prophets and messengers. Welcome to a new episode of your show, Beloved Acquaintances. And as we move along, meeting companion after companion, you start to wonder whether people are being affected by these amazing stories. Do we still remember the details of the first episode? Does Sumaya's story still live on in our hearts? At the end of the day, people, this show has got an objective. The objective is that we love the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions, that we grow attached to them. I hope to God that people aren't tuning in just to hear a good story and get a cozy feeling. The aim is deeper than that. The aim is that we take them as role models and try to imitate them, try to walk in their footsteps and carry this great religion forward on our shoulders just like they did. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that on the day of judgment, a person will be with whomever he loves. Who do you fancy being with on the day of judgment? You in love with Britney Spears or Michael Jordan or Brad Pitt? Then you're going to be resurrected holding hands with them. Or are you hooked to Ali ibn Abi Talib and Aisha bint Abi Bakr? God bless their souls. Do you want to call your child after Omar's name and try to raise him to stand up for justice no matter what, the way Omar did? That's what these stories are for. It's not a moment in history that passed and that's it. No, these stories are to be reflected upon and to be acted upon as well. All right. Let's get back to today's companion. Today's companion is not all that famous. You've probably never heard of him. There aren't many stories about him in the Sira, except for one story. It's a really long story, but it's a really, really important one. And that's the story we're going to talk about today. And this story is dedicated to all those people who have abandoned the Prophet of God, peace be upon him. What do you mean, abandon the Prophet of God? You see, Today's companion is one who abandoned the Prophet of God in one battle. He didn't go out to fight alongside the Prophet. He decided to stay behind instead. There aren't any battles that we can fight today side by side with the Prophet, peace be upon him. But the meaning of abandoning the Prophet is very relevant to us. How so? Abandoning his way. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was sent to bring humanity out of darkness into light. He was sent to bring life to dead hearts. He was sent, sister, to tell you that this worldly existence is very short, that you should live, brother, connected to our Creator by following the path that His beloved Prophet set for us. On that note, the issue is not about missing two rukas of Sunnah. That's not the only way of abandoning the Prophet, peace be upon him. To abandon the Prophet in this century is to live your life without putting God as your main priority. To abandon the Prophet, peace be upon him, is for your life story simply to be I ate, drank, slept, got married, had kids, and then died. Come on, people. Is that possible? You think you were only created for that? No doubt there's a bigger purpose. There's got to be a bigger purpose. What is it? You were created to know your Creator, to get attached to Him, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, is the one who showed you the way. Oh, man, there are so many ways people are abandoning the Prophet, peace be upon him, today. So many different shades and colors of abandonment. Whoever lived for money has abandoned the Prophet, peace be upon him. Whoever lived only for fashion and clothes and hanging out with friends has abandoned the Prophet, peace be upon him. Whoever lived solely for work has abandoned the Prophet, even though work is a part of Islam. But whoever put work as the main purpose of his life, the driving force of his existence, has abandoned the Prophet. People, that's not the objective of life. The objective is to hook up with God and enter paradise. And this is a meaning that people have lost today. People are living for themselves. They can't see past their own desires. Me, myself, and I. And that's it. But from today's companion, we're going to get to see the bigger picture. And I hope we can each take something home with us from the lesson he learned 1400 years ago. So let's begin. Our companion today is Kaab ibn Malik. Kaab ibn Malik. He was an amazing poet. And he had the honor of being one of the prophet's poets. As you know, Poetry back then was a powerful tool. It was like the media these days. And Kaab distinguished himself in defending the Prophet with his poetry against those who attacked the Prophet, peace be upon him. Kaab lived for a long time after the Prophet and died when he was quite old. Kaab was amongst those who took part in most of the battles with the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uhud, al khandaq Khaybar. He was even present at al aqaba You guys remember what al aqaba was from previous episodes? You know, when the Ansar pledged allegiance to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to defend him no matter what? Yup. Kaab was there on that night, and he was very proud to have witnessed that pledge. Now, you may be surprised, 
But he's actually the one who narrates the story of his abandonment. And he tells it with utmost honesty and detail, as you'll see. He doesn't leave anything out. He says it all. I want you to listen to it, not as a story of some guy who lived 1400 years ago. No. I want you to listen to it as if it's your story. Your story of the day you left the Prophet's way. The day you abandoned his instructions. I want the brother who's got a girlfriend to listen to the story and think of himself as Ka'ab ibn Malik and experience the Prophet's reaction to his abandonment. I want the sister who wears tight or revealing clothes to hear this story and think of how she's ignoring the Prophet's instructions. I want the brother who treats his parents with disrespect. The sister who causes grief to her parents. Something which really angers God to put themselves in Ka'ab ibn Malik's shoes. Ka'ab ibn Malik says, The battle of Tabu came. And whenever a battle came along, the Prophet peace be upon him wouldn't tell the army exactly where they were going. He would say for example, that we'll be heading in this direction, and they would indeed head in that direction, but then along the way, they would change routes. So nobody would know exactly where they were going, in order to deceive spies. And this was from the planning and military genius of the Prophet peace be upon him except with the battle of Tabuk. The Prophet intended to head to Tabuk, and so he announced it to the Muslims. I'm intending to go out to Tabuk to fight the Romans there. It was more than a thousand kilometers away. First time the Prophet gives the army exact details of where they were heading. Why did the Prophet, peace be upon him, do this? Why this time? Hmm. The reason is going to help answer why somebody may have thought of staying back. This battle was going to be really, really tough. It was in the middle of summer, so the blazing heat was intolerable. The distance was more than a thousand kilometers. The fruits on the trees were just about to ripen. You know, the livelihood of Medina depended on this. They were low on food, to the extent that this battle was also called the Battle of Difficulty. Who gave it that name? God did in the Quran. Those who followed him in the hour of difficulty. It was going to be a tough journey. A difficult challenge. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, wanted people to prepare real good. He said that the companion would eat a piece of date over three days. Three days, people. That's insane. Man, aren't we living the life? You get ticked off if there wasn't meat on the table every day for lunch. Our day is miserable if the AC stopped working for a couple of hours. I can't live like this. I can't take this no more. No AC. And I wish with all these comforts in our lives we take advantage and do something for Islam. But no, that'd be asking for too much. Anyways, Cap continues. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, announced his intentions of heading towards Tabuk. And I had never missed out on any battle with the Prophet, except for the Battle of Badr. And we weren't blamed for staying back. In other words, he's telling us, yo, don't think that I abandoned the Prophet in Badr. Because nobody knew that there was going to be a battle in the first place. The Prophet didn't order people to prepare for battle then. He was only going out to intercept a caravan. He wasn't going for war. He really wants to make it clear to everybody that he's not to blame for not participating in Badr. I'm not that bad. So Kaab goes on. Never had I been physically stronger or wealthier than at the time of Tabuk. Check out the honesty. And I never in my life, he says, had two rides or two camels, except then. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered us to prepare for battle. So everybody started getting ready until the army was made up of around 30,000 people. Just a side note here. You realize how the number of Muslims evolved over time? Count with me now. At the Battle of Badr, there were how many Muslims? 313. Then came Uhud, 700. Al-Khandaq, around 1,400 fighters. Then came Al Hudaybiyya, again 1400. Same thing for Khaybar, 1400. Muta went up a bit, 3000. And now Tabuk, 30,000. The Muslims really suffered at the start, but they had faith. And as their faith was tested more and more, and they proved to be sincere at heart, their numbers started to be blessed. Their numbers started to jump exponentially. Back to our story. So Kaab says there wasn't a register that kept track of the people who took part in the battle. So whoever had the intention of staying behind would think to himself, the Prophet's not going to realize. But you guys really think that the Prophet didn't realize? Along the way, the Prophet would ask, where is this person? Where is that person? By name, people. He's aware. He knows, man. So Cap continues. So people started getting ready. And every time I wanted to start preparing myself, 
I put it off. Every time I got up to go to the market to buy my supplies, I sit back down. I start feeling heavy. Doesn't that sound familiar, people? You're sitting down watching TV and the time for prayer comes. All right, I'm getting up. But I just got to finish this show. I need to know what happens next. So you finish the show and then you get up. I'm, I'm just going to make this phone call because it's really important. So you make your phone call and by the time you're done, the azan for the next prayer calls. Man, was the devil able to play with you that easily? Kaab says the same thing happened to me. Let's learn something from this before moving on. The next time you just get the idea of praying or giving charity or whatever, get up immediately. Don't wait. Take action right away. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, started to assemble the army. Everybody was ready. And Kaab would say to himself, I can still make it, man. No worries. I can still make it. I can still make it. Talakh. He kept on saying, I can still make it until the Prophet, peace be upon him, started to move with the army. What happened? He's heavy. Kaab ibn Malik was heavy once in his life. But there are people that have been heavy their whole lives. The brother says, I'm going to stop hanging out with these people because they're having a bad influence on me. All right, I'm going to leave them tomorrow. 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 And he never does. The sister's going to put the hijab on. Next week. Next week, inshallah. You know, I'm just waiting till I get engaged. She gets engaged until after my wedding. So I don't feel pressurized to take it off. You'll see. It'll be on as soon as I get my first child. Until my children get older. Until they get married. Until, until, boom. She's 70 years old. The intention was there, but I'm too old now. It's an opportunity, people, that may only come once or twice in your life. Jump on it as soon as it comes. The army left, and Kaab was still sitting around until it became impossible for him to catch up with them. When he realized this, it was like something hit him on the head. He went out and started walking in the city and found nobody except those accused of hypocrisy or those who have really got excuses, like the blind and the crippled. So he became unbelievably worried. He got a panic attack and started to ask himself, how am I going to avoid the prophet's disappointment when he gets back? What would you do, brothers and sisters? We're talking about Kav's story, but this is our story too. Imagine you're sitting in front of the prophet, peace be upon him, and he asks you, why did you abandon me? Why did you do so and so? What would you tell him? Think about it for a moment. Do you even have the guts to face him if your whole life was spent abandoning him? Imagine, on the day of judgment, when the prophet, peace be upon him, sees you and he calls you, you're from among my followers, come, and he's proud of you. And imagine also, as the hadith states, that he recognizes you from among his followers, and he calls you, and as you go towards him, the angels stop you and move you far away. And they tell him, you have no idea what he did after you, Muhammad. So in that case, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Away with you. Get him away. Ouch. What about God? With what face are you going to meet him? You see how this story is very relevant to us? How are you going to deal with this situation, Cab? He says, So I began to consider lying. Uh-oh. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, is on his way back from the battle. And he asked the companions, Where is Cab ibn Malik? So somebody from Banu Salama says, <laughs> He's probably sitting comfortably at home, relaxing. So a companion by the name of Mu'adh ibn Jabal jumps up and responds, No way. We only know good things about Kaab. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, goes silent. Anyways, the Prophet, peace be upon him, finally reached Medina. And it was his habit to first go to the mosque, pray two rakahs, and then sit down and receive the people. So the Prophet sat down, and the hypocrites started flowing in one by one. I'm so sorry, O Prophet of God. Please forgive me. I swear to God I had an excuse. Please, it will never happen again. They would apologize and swear by God. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, would accept their claims and pray for their forgiveness and accept their oaths of allegiance once again. And he'd leave their true intentions for God to judge. So Kaab was watching this. And guess what he decides to do? Let's find out. So he walks in on the Prophet, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, sees him coming. So he smiles at him, but in a disappointed way. You guys know the disappointed smile, right? So Kaab sits down in front of the Prophet, and the Prophet says to him, Why did you stay back? Didn't you have a ride? 
So Cab says, Hmm. What did he say? He said, I swear to God, O prophet of God, if I were sitting in front of anybody other than you, I could have easily gotten out of the whole thing with a convincing excuse. Because I've been blessed with sweet words. In other words, he's a poet. He's eloquent and convincing by nature. But I know for a fact, he says, that if I lied to you right now, I would have avoided your anger in the short run, but sooner or later, God would definitely have exposed me, and then you'd be even more angry with me. But if I tell you the truth, then you'd be upset with me, and I can only hope then for Allah's forgiveness. And then he says, I swear to God, I have no excuse, O Prophet of God, and I swear that I've never been stronger or wealthier than this time. And I swear to God that never in my life did I have two rides like I did this time. Man, you think you can pull that off? Cab sat down with the Prophet, peace be upon him, and told him, I'm at fault. Here are my mistakes. One, two, three, four. He didn't try to hide his faults. He was truthful with himself. When was the last time you sat down and evaluated yourself? That's what Cab did. Just pull out a piece of paper and a pen. Sit down in your room and start writing. Here are my faults. I do this, and I drink this, and I treat my wife like so-and-so. Face yourself. And then put a plan of action on how you're going to become a better person. I swear to God, I have no excuse, O Prophet of God. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, looked at Cab and said, As for this person, he has told the truth. What does that mean, people? It means all these guys who came to the Prophet and gave him excuses left, right, and center were all liars. And the Prophet knew that. But he let God be their judge. So the Prophet then told Kab to get up and wait for the Almighty's decision regarding his case. Kab says, I got up, and when I left, some men followed me and said, What'd you just do, man? You're a pious guy. You're practically sinless. Go back to the Prophet and apologize and give him any excuse like all those other guys did. And surely he'll pray for your forgiveness, and God will forgive you. No big deal. God said, they kept on insisting and pushing me to go back until I started to consider returning to the Prophet and telling him that I told a lie previously. He was going to accuse himself of lying when he told the truth. Imagine, he's human at the end of the day. So Kab asked them, is there anybody else who told the truth like I did? So they told him, yes. There's two other guys who said to the Prophet exactly what you said, and the Prophet gave them the same answer he gave you. Kab asked, who are these two guys? So they told him, Murara ibn Rabi' and Hilal ibn Umayyah. Kab said, these two men are pious individuals who took part in the Battle of Badr. No way, I'm not going to the Prophet. I'm going to do exactly what these two guys did. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered that nobody talk to these three men. Imagine, you're walking in the street and you say salam to everybody and nobody responds? Especially in Medina where the whole city is really tight. Everybody's close. It must have been tough. So Kaab says that the two other men just isolated themselves at home and did nothing but cry. As for me, he says, I was the younger of the three. So I used to roam around in the markets and pray congregational prayer in the mosque with the Muslims. But nobody would say a word to me. Even after the prayer, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, would be sitting down, I would approach him and say, Assalamu alaikum, O Prophet of God. But I wouldn't hear any response. I'd even focus on his lips, hoping that maybe they moved a bit, maybe he responded secretly. Can you imagine the pain this guy is going through? What a shame, bro. A lot of people have abandoned the Prophet, peace be upon him, and don't even care the slightest bit. So I'd focus on his lips, he says hoping that I could see any small movement, anything. But I couldn't tell if he did. Then I'd offer my prayer near to him, and while praying, I'd look at him from the corner of my eye to see if he would look at me. But nothing. So I'd focus on my prayer. While busy with my prayer, I'd get the feeling that he was looking at me. So I'd turn my face towards him, but he would then turn his face away. SubhanAllah, people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, is an educator. But you could feel the love the Prophet has towards Kaab. It's obvious he loves the guy, and it's hurting him to ignore Kaab like that. But there's got to be disciplinary action at times. Kaab would always pray in the mosque, and his only wish was that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would move his lips when he saluted him. But no response.
He says he had a cousin whose name was Abu Qutada. And this cousin was the closest person to Kaab. He was like his best friend. And their houses were right next to each other. They were neighbors. And there was like a wall or a fence that separated the two. So one day, Kaab climbed over the wall and said to Abu Qutada, Assalamu alaikum Abu Qutada. He didn't respond. Kaab said, Assalamu alaikum Abu Qutada. Silence. So Kaab said, Abu Qutada, for God's sake, don't you know that I love Allah and His Messenger? Again, no response. For the sake of God, Abu Qutada, don't you know that I love Allah and His Messenger? He asked him a third time, to which Abu Qutada responded, God and His Messenger know best. So Kaab said, my eyes flooded with tears. People, this guy abandoned the Prophet once, not 20 years, and you see what he's going through? It's not even a physical punishment. Nobody touched him. The punishment was more emotional. You abandoned us, man, and as a result, we're not going to talk to you. Don't you fear the same thing happening to you on the Day of Judgment? Or is the Prophet, peace be upon him, not that valuable to you? Fix your record with God. Repent today. Kaab ibn Malik jumped back over to his side of the wall, crying, mind you, and headed to the marketplace. As he was walking, he saw a Christian farmer from the area of Syria who came to sell his grains in Medina. And this farmer was asking, who could tell me how to find a person by the name of Kaab ibn Malik? Huh? Why is this guy asking about me, Kaab said. So the people started to point at Kaab. You realize how all the Muslims were implementing the Prophet's instructions to the dot? Nobody was saying a word to him, to the extent that they were pointing at him rather than saying, there he is over there. So the farmer went over to Kaab and handed him a letter from the king of Ghassan. For me? Keep in mind that Kaab was a poet, so he was kind of popular. Kaab started reading. We've received news that your friend, i.e. the prophet, has been treating you harshly, and you are definitely not a person that should be degraded and treated with disrespect. So join us, and we will surely honor you. <laughs> Yo, what would you do if you received this letter from a king? Would you say, You guys see what you did? I'm a popular man. I'm to be treated like royalty. You Muslims should know who you're talking to. I'm heading to a place where people know my true value. Kaab read the letter and said to himself, This is just another tribulation. So he ripped it up and burned it. That easily? The letter from the king torn up in seconds? Because he's from the party of God. He doesn't care about no worldly titles. That's the last of his concerns right now. Kaab says that this condition lasted for 40 days. He hasn't spoken a word to a soul in one month and 10 days. On the 40th day, a messenger from the Prophet of God, peace be upon him, came to Kaab and told him, The Prophet of God sent me to you, and he says that God has ordered you to isolate yourself from your wife. Man, if what he's going through wasn't enough, now this? So Kaab said to his wife, can you please go sleep over at your parents' house till God gives his judgment in this manner? So his wife left. Kaab says that the wife of one of the other two guys, Hilal ibn Umayyah, went to see the Prophet of God and said to him, O Prophet of God, Hilal is an old and helpless man. Would you allow me to serve and help him out? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Of course, no problem. But he doesn't approach you. She said, O Prophet of God, the guy's got no desire for anything. I swear he's done nothing but cry since day one. Forty days this guy's been crying, people. Things were getting tough for the three guys. Cab was really starting to feel the heat. He felt like he was a stranger, even in his own home. He felt like he was choking, man. On the fiftieth day, Cab was offering the Fajr prayer on his rooftop. Going to the mosque and praying in congregation became too difficult for him to bear. It was too much for him to handle. So while he was sitting down after the prayer on the roof, he says, I heard somebody from one of the mountaintops shouting from the top of his lungs, Oh, Kaab ibn Malik, good news! When I heard that, I fell on the ground in prostration, realizing that relief has come. A guy on a horse then dashed over to my house to tell me that the messenger of God had announced the acceptance of our repentance. Then the man who shouted from the mountaintop arrived to give me the good news in person. Because he was the first one to tell me, I took off my garment and gave it to him as a gift. I swear I owned no other garment, but I was so happy, I was so ecstatic, 
that I wanted to reward him. So I borrowed some garments to go see the Prophet of God. On the way to the mosque, tons of people were congratulating me because Allah had accepted my repentance. You guys see how close this society is? You see the love they had for one another? If I were to ask you what the happiest day of your life was, would it be the day you got married? Or the day you gave birth? Or maybe the day you got a job with a top company? Nah, people. Believe me, no. The happiest day of your life is when God accepts your repentance. The happiest day of your life is when you've been closing the door on God for the past 20 years. And then you turn to Him and He becomes your top priority. People, when are you going to repent and celebrate your repentance? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that God is thrilled with the repentance of one of His servants. Repent from the sins that have taken over your lives for years and years. When will we congratulate you, sister, for finally putting on the hijab? When will we congratulate you, brother, for leaving alcohol or drugs or adultery? Kaf says, So I entered the mosque and found the Prophet sitting down with people around him. When he saw me, his face lit up. We could always tell whenever he was happy, because his face would shine as if it were the moon. So I sat before him, and with his bright, joyous smile, he said to me, Rejoice! with the best day that you've ever experienced since the day you were born. I said to the Prophet, Is this forgiveness from you or from Allah? He told me, No, it's from Allah. A Quranic verse was revealed specifically addressing Kaab and the two other guys in the chapter on repentance. Listen. And Allah also turned in mercy to the three who stayed behind. Imagine, a verse talking about you that Allah forgave you, that is recited till the end of times. SubhanAllah. You see the beauty of repentance? You see the beauty of telling the truth? It's true that Kaab paid a big price for telling the truth. But at the end of the day, he could go to sleep knowing that he did the right thing. Kaab told the Prophet, O Messenger of God, as part of my repentance, I pledged to donate all of my wealth to charity. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, no, Kaab, keep at least some of your wealth. So Kaab agreed to keep the share he received from the Battle of Khaybar and to donate everything else. Kaab also said, as part of my repentance as well, I vow to tell nothing but the truth for as long as I live. And a verse was revealed addressing the hypocrites that swore to the Prophet, giving him excuse after excuse for not taking part in the battle. God says, they swear to you that you may be pleased with them, but if you are pleased with them, Certainly Allah is not pleased with the rebellious people. You see the results at the end, people? You see the final score? There you have it, folks. We've reached the end of our episode. But before signing off, let's quickly summarize the lessons we picked up from Kaf's story. Number one, the truth and nothing but the truth. Regardless of the situation, no matter what the consequences are, always stick to the truth. Second lesson is tied to the first, but it's on a more personal front. Be honest with yourself and take note of your mistakes. Evaluate yourself every now and then. Face your shortcomings and don't try to ignore them. Finally, people, lesson number three is to step back for a moment and re-evaluate our priorities in life. We cannot continue to abandon the Prophet, peace be upon him. We cannot continue to put God, our Creator people, on the sidelines. Nobody's saying you can't have fun. Nobody's asking you to throw out your personality. But where is God in your life equation? Where is His Messenger's teachings in your life? Are you going to have any regrets if you suddenly depart from this world today? I guess I'll leave you with those important questions. And until we meet again with another beloved acquaintance.